Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to all our uh, our, our Sangha, our, our community. It feels so wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And I, I, have to, I have to share a secret that, uh, you know, last week, after many of you had left, you know, some of us, uh, you know, stayed on and had a wonderful, uh, you know, half an hour of, of chatting and getting to know each other. So you're very, very welcome to join us. And uh, one of the stars of that evening was Pasangla, who I, I, I see. And anyway, uh, that small talk for later. But... Uh, uh, I, I, you find me here again at the at the nudging and urging of my friend uh, Norzin, uh, who is impossible to resist. Uh, it really is. This is the uh, yesterday was the anniversary of His Holiness receiving the Nobel Peace Prize on the 10th of December in Oslo uh, in 1989. Uh, I had the great privilege of uh, accompanying him to the award ceremony, and uh, my most vivid memory of that. Uh, was the uh, how it uh, we were all very excited, but how he, you know, this this embodiment of Avalokiteshvara, uh, to whom awards mean so little, uh, you know, was engaged, but uh, yet it was just another day for him, another opportunity uh, to continue uh, as a bodhisattva. Uh, to 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 enable us to learn from him, so even for a moment that most people, uh, my apologies for this, you know, considered uh, to be a, a pinnacle of achievement uh, for holiness, his holiness, it was really, uh, you know, meant very little uh, other than the opportunity it gave him uh, to reach out and to continue to make a difference in the world, and so uh, each year, I think we celebrate him and we celebrate the event. Uh, uh, which for him was, you know, just something else, uh, one more moment in his life. And so we requested uh, Lakhtarla uh, to say uh, a brief prayer in Tibetan. And uh, in case an English translation doesn't pop up on the screen, uh, I will sort of, you know, just read it out so that we have a sense of uh, what we're saying. So if I may request uh, Lakhtarla, uh, and if the prayer can come up so that we can try and, in our poor, non-existent Tibetan, uh, try and um, repeat that and follow him. So, Norzin and then Black Black. Sorry, Rave, Korve, Shingam, so Pendon, Dewa, Malu, Jungwe, Nechere, Sewa, Tenzin, Jos. Sabi Sidi Pardo Tenjuru Si Kanri Rave Korve Shingam So Pendon Devam Dungwe Ne Chere Sewan Tenjin Jaso Ye Sabi Sidi Pardo Tenjuru Si Kanri Rave Korve Shingam So Pendon Devam Alu Dungwe Ne Chere Sewan Tenjin Jaso Ye Sabi Sidi Pardo Tenjuru Si 
Uh, may I request that we, in English, we all uh, sort of repeat this together. Could you bring it up on screen, uh, Seringla? <clears throat> Yeah, could you bring that uh, prayer up on the screen again so we can all recite it in English? Okay, so I mean, you know, feel free to put on your uh, microphones. I'll give you five seconds in which to do that. And then in English, if we may together, uh, you know, recite this to honor uh, the source uh, of our inspiration, our teachings that come through uh, uh, Geshe Lakhtarla, who we are blessed to have us, we have us have with us. Uh, so uh, let's all uh, repeat together. In the heavenly realm of Tibet, surrounded, surrounded by a chain of snow mountains, the source of all happiness and help for beings. <clears throat> Chandraji in person. May his life be pure for hundreds of years. For hundreds of kalpas. And may we stay blessed by his blessing. Thank you. Lakala, over to you. So it is wonderful to start to this session with this uh, prayer for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This prayer being composed by the Tibetan teacher in the context of Tibetan people. So it's talking about source of happiness and help for beings in the land of snow, which means Tibetans. But this does not mean to say that his compassion is only for the Tibetans. Because the very definition of uh, our Lokateshwara in Tibetan we call it Chere Singh, means whose eye is widely looking towards suffering sentient beings all the time. Chere Singh. Chere Singh means Chere means the, the wide open eye. Zik means always looking towards the well being of other sentient beings. So therefore, and then also the prayer says, His Holiness is source of all happiness and help, happiness and help. <clears throat> the English translation, I don't know, but basically it means Pemba means benefit actually, which means temporary benefit. Whatever temporary benefit we need is source of that. And also happiness, benefit and happiness. Happiness means long-term happiness and peace. So whether it's you know temporary benefit or long-term happiness is the source. How is Avalokiteshvara or His Holiness as the embodiment of Avalokiteshvara is the source of benefit and happiness for all sentient beings is His Holiness or the actual Avalokiteshvara, they're basically embodiment of compassion. Compassion by now you know, by definition means one who is really like refers to that quality where one wishes to remove the sufferings of all sentient beings. And this wish to remove sufferings of all sentient beings comes because there is this loving kindness. There is this feeling of closeness towards all sentient beings. And when you have this genuine feeling of, you know, closeness towards all sentient beings, just like you have to your brother, sister, or whoever is close to your heart, then naturally you will show your concern when they are suffering, when they are having problems. So that, that comes automatically. So that's why the other day I was saying that whether it's development of loving kindness or compassion, if we're able to develop one of this quality, you know, in a more kind of refined way, proper way, then naturally our feeling towards other people will automatically change. Other sentient beings will automatically change. And this change is possible from the fact that we all want happiness, do not want suffering. And much of the sufferings that we encounter are, that we encounter are not because we want it, but because of our ignorance, just like small kids making mistakes by not knowing. So we are not better than those small innocent kids. So sentient beings are in that sense innocent. <laughs> Nobody wants suffering, you know, but 
lack of knowledge and lack of understanding. We go for short-term pleasure, then the long-term happiness, and then we stuck with all the problems. And the question about whether His Holiness is the manifestation of our Lokadeshabara or not is also an important point to think about. Because those people who do not have much faith or who do not have much understanding, they might think that, oh, this is again another man made thing that he, he looks, looks like another human being, you know, not so different, right? We think like that, unfortunately. I say unfortunate because our perception is limited. Normally, we end up seeing what we want to see, not, not what we should be seeing. In other words, we don't see the reality. Long time back, I read a book by uh, John Blofield. He's a very senior uh, gentleman in, from England. And uh, I met him, interestingly, I met him in uh, China when I was making a tour many, many years back. I met him there. And he has spent, I think, over 30 years in that part of the world. Now, of course, even at that time, he was very elderly. Now I'm sure he is not, no, no more. And he wrote a book. In that book, he, he, he has heard that His Holiness is the emanation of Avalokiteshvara. And then he tried to find out how or what or how our Lokiteshwara, if he comes in, present, in person, in, in front of you, how does he look different from His Holiness Dalai Lama? Or how His Holiness looks different from our Lokiteshwara? He wondered and he penned down those observations. And then he concluded by saying, the only difference I could imagine between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and actual our Lokiteshwara, he says, probably that our Lokiteshwara in person may have a big halo around his head. Probably that may be the only difference. <laughs> Otherwise, in terms of compassion, you know, serving other sentient beings, he sees no difference. So that's one point I really want to tell you. It's very important. And then, uh, Rajiv, you'll recall that this John Blofield was the one who wrote this uh, small text in which he, sold, he requested his holiness to write a book for those who are not tantric initiates, but who also wants to do some meditation. And then later on, Rajiv, you took the responsibility of requesting His Holiness to give an elaborate teaching on this. And then we had this book, Cultivating Daily Meditation. So Which that is the story. Published. Which you published, the library published that. Yes, we published, <laughs> but, but you walked, you know, you did oh. all the work. <laughs> so there's a very interesting story. There's one thing that I wanted to tell. Then second thing I want to tell you, which is actually a good news is that recently we published a few books by His Holiness's uh, secretary, Tibetan secretary, Lopsa Jimbala. He penned down many, many unique things that he observed when he was working as his secretary. So we published recently two books. And uh, this, both of these books contains many small like topics and uh, which are like not uh, ordinary but very kind of superhuman kind of things that his holiness did and which he observed. He has written that down. So just two days back, I wrote him a letter saying that, would you give us the permission to get it translated into Hindi and uh, English? And he said, of course, this is wonderful if you are able to do it, but then problem is not easy to find somebody who can translate it in English and especially in Hindi. So if you find somebody who is willing to do, has the capacity to do, will be happy to collaborate with that. Otherwise, we'll have to attempt or find somebody from the library itself to do that job. So the my main point is, so there in that book, he mentions all those unique, almost like superhuman instances, clearly showing that he's not an ordinary human being. Like for example, he his, his capacity to recall somebody he met 30 years back when he was escaping from Tibet on the border, the, there was a soldier who was, his soldiers was very tired and he, he assisted his soldiers to, to walk. And then after 30 years, when he visited that area again, among the crowd, he immediately recognized, are you that person who helped me 30 years back when I came from Tibet? I mean, instances like that. Then there are other occasions where his soldiers clearly says, accepts that he is Avalokiteshvara. Normally, of course, he doesn't do that. But in special 
you know, in, in front of special teachers and special, sometimes he, in a joking way, he says, you're sitting in front of our Lokateshwar or things like that, you see? So there are many reasons. So that may be quite interesting for all of us to read because unless we, you know, ordinary human beings, unless you see some of these so-called miracles, <laughs> which is actually, there's nothing called miracle, you know, you do something which we can't do, it's miracle. But uh, we're fond of like listening to miracles and uh, believing to that rather than doing an in-depth study on, you know, shunyata and <laughs> things like that. So I think that will be very, very useful for people to develop stronger faith. So that's again a good news. So I wanted to, you know, inform that. Okay, for, for Nonjin and uh, Sering Namjel, you know, it's already in Tibetan. You have to read it. And there are many others who may be listening, you know, you can read it in Tibetan. So that's number one. Number two, as Rajiv asked me to give a little introduction about this text for those who will join later on. Or who is, uh, one thing that I want to tell you is most of this Buddhist text is they basically carry few essential messages. And the most important message is how to develop bodhicitta and how to develop wisdom, understanding, emptiness, which we normally call as conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. So there is the essence. Most of the text, if you read, because these are really like the two wings of the bird which, by which you can soar to the state of enlightenment, fly to the state of enlightenment. So as a, as a kind of contributing factor, there are many things like development of loving kindness, compassion, practice of the six or 10 perfections and 100,000 things you, you need to do. But the focus is to develop that, you know, highly, highly developed loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta. And then with that, that realization of the way things are, so, so that you are able to see the connection between all sentient beings, so that you are able to see the connection that you have with the environment and things like that. And once you have, once you are able to develop that precise insight into the way things exist, then you don't see any room for unnecessary division in the name of men and women, this caste, that caste, this society, that society, all the stupid, you know, divisions that we are making. Divisions are made by small-minded people, you see? So once you see, for example, it's not only like in the Buddhist teaching, but people, you know, the, the, the people who travel into the space. I was reading that story, you know, the higher and higher you fly, the less and the, the less you see the, the boundary and territory, the man-made territory and boundary. And then once you fly very high, you see there's just small earth, one, small entity, there's no division, no boundary, nothing. And many of these space, you know, people who travel to this space, they came back completely transformed and changed. And they're able to see how stupid we are making all these divisions and especially fighting and killing each other. See no meaning there. So these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, these enlightened beings are like that. They have, you know, penetrated, penetrated into the depth or the, you know, of those, those, those ultimate reality. Once you see the ultimate reality, there's no room for division. The sameness, how people in the conventional state are struggling because of not knowing the reality and how you can get liberated by seeing the reality. And that's why occasionally he sold in the Dalai Lama, men talks about, especially the man-made sufferings as unnecessary suffering, unnecessary suffering. Some of the sufferings created through flood and famine and tsunami and things like that are to, us, to some extent understandable. That also has a karmic connection, but on, on an ordinary parlance, that's understandable. But more than this natural calamities, how many man-made problems are there? Much of the problem there we, that we are experiencing today is due to man-made problems out of ignorance. Egotism, right? Small mindedness, things like that. So, with this kind of teaching and talk and listening to the in wisdom coming from all sources, what we should really, you know, hope and expect is transform and change our attitude so that we, we can build a better planet, better earth where everybody can live happily. And that is possible, not impossible. Possible in the sense 
there, 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 there cannot be like a push button enlightenment in one day, of course. But imagine if you are able to create a warm atmosphere in your own home, in the family. You can already have, have a test of nirvan there in your home. If everybody is smiling and enjoying the food together, helping each other, you know, not fighting, not criticizing each other, imagine. So from there, then the, the, the ripple effect will be there. To a, the circle can go wider and wider. And that is the only choice. So as I said before, th this is not the, the, the spiritual practice that we are talking about is, it's not, not a luxury pursuit, luxurious pursuit. It is a basic necessity without which we cannot have happiness and live happily. And especially given the, the extent of you know, damage that is done to the environment and so forth now, and then the unnecessary problem that we are suffering today, we should really, really wake up. And especially with this actual experience over the COVID-19 and many other things, we should really get transformed. Don't, don't just think that one day something will happen, no. We need to really take drastic steps, obtaining the mind, changing the attitude, based on Buddhist teachings, based on the scientific findings and things like that. So that is the goal of this, these meetings, right? So, so therefore, this, this, this book also talks about basically the, the focus is development of bodhicitta and wisdom, understanding, emptiness. And for that, you need to remove all the hurdles. The, 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 the hurdle to bodhicitta is self-cherishing attitude, where you think just about yourself and completely neglect the well-being of others. Then the obstacle and obstruction to wisdom, understanding, emptiness is the self-grasping, which means seeing things as having inherent independent existence, right? So therefore, uh, all this text is basically boiled down to one thing. That is to remove your self-cherishing attitude and cultivate the mind that cherishes the well-being of all other sentient beings. And to do that, you need to really develop a you know, uh, precise insight into the way things are. We call it shunyata, but I use, sometimes call it the reality that is written in the rocks, in the mountains, in the forest, in human beings. The nature of everything that is existent is same, that they are all interdependent, interconnected. And unless you take proper care of the causes and conditions for their proper sustenance, for their proper growth, whatever it is, is going to crumble, die, become extinct. Right? So in that sense, there is really no religiosity here. It's, it's a question of our own survival, right? Even for this life, right? So therefore, this, these teachings become very, very important. And therefore, the name, you know, the gem, precious gem, wish-fulfilling gem, is very, very befitting, very, very befitting. And more than any piece of material, you know, belongings, these internal possessions, like compassion, loving kindness, and so forth, even if you're just able to develop it for a second, for a moment, it will completely take the burden from your shoulder. That's 100% sure. The only problem is we are not able to practice these things sincerely. We are not able to develop conviction. We just go by the book or go by the crowd, saying that everybody is going, I should go, everybody's reading, I should read. And we never try to implement it in our life. So that is the only problem. But otherwise, if you make, you know, make an effort, you can definitely, definitely change. That, that, is, that is very, very possible, right? And based on our ordinary life experience also, the older you grow, the more you're able to realize the importance of these qualities. An adult or a young person who is like, full of the energy of the youth, may not pay much attention to this, especially if your things are taken care of by your parents, you may not pay much attention to these inequalities, but as you grow older and older, through life's experience, you know the importance of these qualities. So therefore it is important to 
uh, appreciate and cultivate these qualities when we are younger, not when we grow very old. When you grow very old, you do the practice. Yes, it's of course good, but sometimes it might become the last ditch struggle. You know? <laughs> it may not be very effective. And especially if His Holiness is repeatedly mentioned, especially when you want to do some tantric practice. And then all these tantric practices where you visualize the channels and the, the wind and so forth, this is you know, possible when, when, when your energies, your channels is, is supple and fresh and good, not when they're all become like <laughs> hardened and uh, difficult to uh, breathe also, energy is also not flowing properly. And that is difficult, right? So, so therefore, we should consider ourselves lucky and fortunate to be able to read such precious text. And uh, the today's text, as we briefly touched during the last session, really teaches about how to come out of that, that muddy water, that, that thick mud. If you're crossing through a thick, muddy water, you know, unless you roll Nordin has used a what what roll up your bottom or something, <laughs> right? So 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 that that way that way you can you can keep your clothes clean and things like that. Not only that, you there is also risk of not only mudding your cloth, but there is a risk of getting completely stuck. I I'm not able to read. This is a very lengthy text. I'm not able to read everything, but somewhere I remember it mentioning that when you get stuck in that mud. For example, he gives the example of trying to cross that, that mud riding on a horse. Then the horse gets all the four legs stuck in the mud. And then the horse is unable to move. Then the only thing you, 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 are, you, you are supposed to do is to, to dismount that horse and try to cross that mud by yourself. But in that case also, you, your, both of your feet get, get stuck. And when you, when you use one of your hand to pull it out, it also gets stuck. And finally, you might die there, get stuck, right? So therefore, in this, the four lines of the root text, which we read already, discard attachment in anything and live without attachment. Due to attachment, even happy migration is not attained. And moreover, it, it takes the life of liberation. That's what we mentioned, but in this text, it gives a beautiful explanation of the twelve links of dependent origination. Now, in the twelve links of dependent origination, the the most powerful cause is ignorance, right? But here he mentions all these twelve links of dependent origination, but he makes this emphasis on removing the attachment. Why? Because out of all these negative emotions, that the one negative emotion that is responsible for making us get stuck in the samsara is attachment. You come again and again, again back into the samsara because of your attachment to somebody. For example, if you're on your deathbed and somebody comes and cries and kisses your forehead and things like that, then you wish that, that you, you want to live longer and don't want to die. You develop that attachment and that attachment then becomes the main factor for your getting stuck in the samsara. So therefore, some of the teachers, they say, you know, just as if you pro un properly understand life, for example, if I am invited by Nonzilla for a cup of tea, then I go there and have a cup of tea. And then after that, I'll say, Nonzilla, please. Okay, now I'm leaving. I'll see you after. Nonzilla, understand. Gishila, take care. Bye-bye. Right? So we should be able to do something like that to that person who is dying, who is on the deathbed. So instead of being able to do that, we normally cry, lament, and disturb the mind of that person also. So therefore, through Dharma practice, we should behave in such a way that the tranquility of the mind of that dying person is not disturbed, right? Instead, you should do, in the case of some of the great teachers, when they are passing away, they would request their student to recite a text on dependent origination, text on bodhicitta, and then just concentrating and listening to that, they pass away peacefully, right? Of course, that is not easy, 
is not easy unless you are familiar with all those texts. For example, you know what people have asked this question. You know what should we do? To, you know to a dying person, what should we do? Then he's always suggested that if that dying person is a non-Buddhist, then to this non-Buddhist who has never studied Buddhism and is now dying, and on that death deathbed when that person is suffering, if you try to teach some of the Buddhist shalokas and things like that. Instead of helping that person, it will harm the mind of that person because he will be completely confused. So therefore, for that person, let him you know, see something that he likes to see, even if it is a musical instrument that he likes, probably hang it there, things like that. So, so create an environment which brings calmness and peace in the mind of that person. So there are different strategies, right? So those of you, the only thing that I want to say here is these two links of dependent origination is very, very deep and very, very profound. And it talks about how we get stuck in the samsara cycle of existence, the two links, two cycles of dependent origination, right? So prior to explaining this, we need to have a understanding of the meaning of dependent origination in general. Now, when we say dependent origination, it should be understood at least in two levels. Dependent origination in the case of those permanent phenomena and dependent origination in the case of those that are impermanent, right? So in the, in the case of the permanent phenomena, like shunyata itself, they are called you know, permanent because they are not dependent on a particular cause and condition. And now these are not so easy to understand, okay? But at least, <laughs> This is what is said in the text. So, although a permanent phenomena like nirvan or, you know, uh, shunyata and things like that, they are not dependent on cause and condition, but still they are called dependent, dependently originated phenomena, because they are also dependent on designation, name, terms that is being given there, labels that is being given there. So from that point of view. So on a wider perspective, when we talk about dependent origination, it should be understood in terms of everything, the conditioned, unconditioned, permanent, impermanent, as being designated. There's nothing whatsoever which is existent and which, which, which is not designated, right? So understand in that way. Now precisely in the case of the conditioned phenomena or impermanent phenomena, Dependent origination primarily means, although that connotation of being designated is also there, but it is primarily understood in terms of dependent on causes and conditions. Now what affects our life is not so much about this dependent origination in the context of permanent phenomena, but impermanent phenomena. It's this impermanent phenomena which we, with which we have to you know, uh, interact. So therefore we talk about the two links of dependent origination, right? So therefore within this, you know, especially now with the dependent origination, there are the afflictive class or the, the pure class or impure class. The pure class means how you can, by, by, by stopping ignorance, how can you stop action and things like that. The impure class means how ignorance produces the, the action and then the, how the action leaves an imprint on the consciousness things like that. So both this pure class and impure class must be understood. I'm just giving you a small introduction. I myself, I don't claim that I know the depth. So for, but I see the importance of understanding this very, very properly. And you need to really, really like bother your dear head to understand this properly. You need to spend time. And for a long time, I've really been thinking about all the studies. One thing that we should really do is how to fight with these negative emotions. Now, in order to fight with neg negative emotions, you need to know precisely the, the, the nature of these negative emotions, the features of these negative emotions, the opportunistic attitude of these negative emotions, the harm that is being done by these negative emotions, and how these negative emotions are your sworn enemy. Once you're able to precisely understand the destructiveness, the enemy nature of the negative emotions, 
then you will develop this willingness to not to surrender yourself to the dictates of the negative emotions and at least give a fight. And don't run, not to run away from the battlefield before giving a fight. So that kind of understanding will come. I'm afraid we seem to have lost uh, Dr. Lavo. Give him a few moments. Norjin, may I request you to uh, give him a call and to see if it's been a loss of uh, power. Well, I can see her talking to uh, Dr. Lau on the phone, and let's see if something can happen for us. Hi everyone. So sorry, Geshilas lost his connection. He said he'll try to rejoin, but if he fails in the next five minutes, then we will resume with our Sangha meeting for those of us who can stay behind and do a little interaction. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we'll just sort of, uh, you know, continue. Uh, thank you, Susan, for pointing out that my uh, <laughs> fountain was making a noise. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure how we should, uh, you know, go about this. But if anybody had any, uh, you know, thoughts, uh, you know, we're all fellow uh, practitioners and, and fellow travelers on the path. So if there are any sort of things that you want to share or discuss, so that we can ask of each other and bounce of each other. And uh, uh, I mean, we'd be happy to set the ball rolling. And I think, you know, one of the questions really, uh, you know, we ask ourselves, I think, you know, Lakhtarla, you know, raised this very, very important uh, uh, aspect of um, shunyata and dependent origination. Probably one of the most difficult uh, um, uh, ideas uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism and uh, somewhat exclusive to it because it forms the basis of, uh, you know, Buddhist agnosticism in a sense and where the Buddha argued that, look, it's really not important uh, whether uh, a creator God exists or not. And um, so when we talk about uh, Avalokiteshvara uh, and, and um, uh, Geshe I was pointing to this, uh, is really that, uh, you know, does uh, Avalokiteshvara exist 
uh, in absolute terms? Uh, uh, is, is, is he as much an idea as he concretely manifests or, uh, you know, the values he embodies uh, manifest in uh, his holiness? And uh, uh, it, it often confuses uh, me and, and, and people is that when we talk about these deities, you know, whether it is Avalokiteshvara or Tara, and people often ask, do they exist? And, uh, you know, recently, you know, somebody I know well was uh, you know, is, is suffering from cancer. And I felt I uh, wanted to do a practice uh, to help her heal. And there's a wonderful book that uh, Lama uh, Zopa Rinpoche has done called Ultimate Healing about working with the medicine Buddha, the menla, uh, the Buddha of healing. And I have a traditional practice of many years. And so I felt, shall I switch uh, to a practice of Menla? And then it occurred to me that, you know, maybe the deity that I normally uh, uh, practice and worship, which is Hayagriva, would be upset because I'd now switched my loyalties <laughs> from one deity to the next. So my teacher, you know, Lakta Law is one of them, you know, reminded me that uh, the deity doesn't have an absolute uh, independent existence. And so uh, really that, uh, you know, what uh, as a, a Buddhist practitioner does is that he, uh, uh, in his uh, mind's eye, in his emotional presence, uh, he generates. And so we have a, a, a practice in Tibetan Buddhism called generation stage. So he then generates the deity uh, from literally nothingness and, uh, and then worships and supplicates to the deity. And then when the practice is over, uh, the deity dissolves uh, again uh, into Shunya. And so when we talk about uh, Avalokiteshvara, and uh, I mean, I have to say that uh, uh, part of my practice is to visualize uh, my teacher, His Holiness, as Avalokiteshvara. And uh, he's real uh, for me uh, in the form, the human form uh, of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is in human form, and uh, he has promised us that he will be around uh, you know, till he's 113. And so many followers and many of uh, those of us uh, uh, who sort of, you know, how to put it, learn so much from His Holiness, and particularly in amongst Tibetans, they've evolved these long life prayers uh, because it is so rare in human history of to be in the presence or to be born at the same time as uh, when a deity manifests in human form. And so the human form then demonstrates uh, the that you know the, the aspiration that those qualities are achievable, and that is a huge uh, inspiration and motivation, and and that is really what we get from uh, uh, His Holiness above all, you know the 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 the, uh, the confidence that our aspirations in worshipping the deity, not just of Alakateshvara and other deities, uh, is possible because here's someone who manifests it. And I think that the book, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know the title, it's a Tibetan title, uh, that uh, a very close associate of uh, His Holiness has uh, written and documented, is really these facets uh, of His Holiness. And I don't know if I, I mean, you know, I, I, I share the story whenever anybody will listen to me, uh, and that isn't very often. And so I mean, forgive me for sort of, you know, grabbing the spotlight you know, to share this perspective with you. But uh, um, I, um, you know, His Holiness, uh, uh, you know, when, we, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize and he used part of the money to set up our foundation and part of the money he gave to Baba Amte. And uh, Baba Amte, uh, he considered as an embodiment of compassion. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with Baba Amte, he did sort of iconic work uh, in, in India for the victims of uh, leprosy. 
and you know, people who had leprosy, people who were recovering from them. And he created a community uh, that needed to be isolated from the surrounding areas because there was this traditional resistance to people who had leprosy. I'm also a filmmaker, so I then made a film on Baba Amte, and His Holiness saw this and was very moved and said, I want to meet Baba Amte. And, uh, and, so the, and there was some sort of inhibition by you know, some of us around him that he should go into this, this community of leprosy, but His Holiness was determined. And so we went, we traveled to Anandvan. And uh, so uh, it, it was a very transforming uh, experience to see how people who had been victims of leprosy and were shunned and still had, you know, sort of gnarled fingers and, you know, their bodies was distorted. And the self-confidence uh, which they carried themselves uh, and were inspired by Baba Amte's compassion, that you didn't feel any sort of sense of uh, protecting oneself from people who had leprosy or who were recovering from leprosy. Uh, and, you know, of course, I think that, you know, modern medicine had ensured that they were not infectious, so you wouldn't do anything foolish. And so his holiness is sort of plunged into this, into this community. And, uh, and those of you from outside India, uh, have a little glass in front of me. So, you know, it often is that when you, you know, go out into a tea shop, people will sort of, oh my God, let me just get you started. You know, you put your fingers in four glasses and, uh, uh, you know, serve people tea or whatever it is. And then, and, and, you know, we were all drinking from this while uh, His Holiness uh, and His Holiness himself. And uh, so the next morning, the His Holiness and Baba, you know, decided to go around uh, the community and we were all told to sort of, you know, wait on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, after a while, uh, you know, the two men uh, were howling. And I haven't seen, I mean, I've seen His Holiness with tears in his eyes when he's moved, when he sees somebody suffering or, uh, but they were howling both these men. And they came back and uh, His Holiness said, you know, talking about compassion, uh, you only, I only teach what you practice. And that was a very powerful and moving moment that from someone uh, you know, like His Holiness, who we consider the embodiment of compassion. And so it really taught us that uh, inner compassion is not just what you do, because sometimes, uh, you know, our actions can appear compassionate, uh, but they're actually uh, motivated by, you know, seeking recognition or reward or uh, feeling good that, you know, I've done a good deed and I've been virtuous. And so I've earned some brownie points in heaven. And uh, so here was a man who radiated his holiness, uh, you know, radiated uh, compassion as intention by who he was, and of course by what he does. But here was Baba Amte in a in a much in a smaller community, uh, who was actually manifesting it in action, without that uh, formal framework of uh, study or, or or the practice or the, or the theories or the ideas of compassion. And you know, they became uh, extremely good friends. And when Baba Amte was ill and dying, he asked His Holiness to pray for him. And it was a very close uh, relationship. And His Holiness is still in touch with Baba Amte's sons who, you know, travel to, I mean, who live in Anandvan and in the Himalkasa and continue his work. And so I really just wanted to share this sort of, you know, personal uh, you know, experience and insight uh, of His Holiness and, and, and His manifestation of compassion. So, I mean, that's really all that I wanted to share. And it would be wonderful if, uh, you know, some of you on, you know, here are teachers yourselves and uh, students of Lakhtarla and Buddhism. So if you have any, you know, thoughts or ideas or experiences to share or questions that you want to ask of, uh, you know, each other, uh, you know, please uh, say a few words uh, introducing yourselves and, and, and who you are and the stage is yours. <laughs> And uh, uh, please, uh, I, I think the normal uh, thing we were, I see Rina. Yes, Rina, please make a, come on in. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Sering, are you, can people unmute themselves, please? Sorry, if Sering's not here. Uh, those of you who want to say something, you can just raise hands that way I can more easily locate you and send you unmute request, please. Yeah, I've just sent her an unmute request. 
I did not receive. Maybe only the yeah, main yeah. post. I'm able to. I'm able yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not doing it. Okay, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Um. You know. Uh. I feel a little hesitant, hesitant asking the question because I'm new to this, and I'm sure this has been discussed and answered, you know, uh, or or understood by all of you. But I'll ask nevertheless, um, which is that you spoke about shunyata, and uh, so when you when you say the deity resolve, uh, you know, dissolves into shunyata, and when I pray again, is it the same deity which gets you know regenerated? Or is it with a different energy, and uh, then uh, I mean that is part one of the question. And the second is that then shunyata for me is actually then everything. It, it's like it's not like of no value. It's not zero. It's it's really everything. Then I mean it, it's something which is I don't know. That's I can't I can't even articulate my question yet. But these were the two ones well i think that this is a question we should ask uh, latarla uh, it's extremely uh, you know complex and uh, difficult and if there is anybody who sort of uh, feels they want to share an insight on this um, please raise your hand yeah roy just had his hand raised but i couldn't look okay Great, I've sent you the request. Elroy. Yeah, um, I just want to add actually on the, on Shunyata. Uh, I mean, the, from the theory of the Big Bang, we have actually like like a, a voidness or an emptiness or something like that, and then from from that explodes into everything that you see and the planets and yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Well, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to just share uh, something and say that uh, uh, I'm not at all sure that you know I am right and that I have uh, got it, uh, and I think that this is a question that we will pass on to uh, Lakdarla, but just a, th and a few sort of you know thoughts on this, and uh, basically that uh, you know the challenge in uh, the, the the tradition uh, is that. Um, uh, historically, uh, there was a juxtaposition of method and wisdom. So we are really talking about non-conceptual insights and experiences, which we are trying to verbalize. And, you know, so, I mean, I often say, look, I mean, if I can't tell you what coffee tastes like, unless you've tasted coffee, uh, it's very difficult uh, to you know to share and i certainly haven't experienced uh, shunya uh i i've you know i've read around it and i i will share a little bit of you know what one what one can read about shunya it's extremely complex and but one thing it is not it is not emptiness uh in the sense of the absence of whatever and the challenge that the spiritual tradition and certainly buddhism has faced because it's the most recent uh, exposure to English and the English vocabulary uh, has been that in, this, in the early 70s, when His Holiness started teaching, a lot of people and Westerners came in and gave, uh, you know, sort of English phrases, which are not entirely accurate, uh, even accurate approximations of what the word really means. Uh, so, for example, we now know that uh, Dukkha, uh, in uh, in uh, Pali uh, is not um, uh, suffering. It is more, you know, translates as dissatisfaction. And so the Four Noble Truths have now become, you know, truths about suffering, the causes of suffering, and this, you know, the, the exit of suffering. Because His Holiness would argue that, you know, uh, dissatisfaction and suffering are part of the human condition, but we can change our relationship to it. Uh, and then not experience the suffering of suffering. And similarly in uh, Shunya, and, and uh, if I can read your name right, Elroy mentioned, you know, the Big Bang. And, you know, of course, that the, you know, the, the question arises, what happened before the Big Bang? And uh, so, uh, you know, Lakhrala was talking about, you know, causes and conditions. So uh, the essence of uh, Buddhism is causality 
that everything has a cause and uh, and then that leads to something but then someone turns around and said what is the primary cause i mean when was the first cause you know how did that happen and the only reason i've been able i've been able to understand it imperfectly and which is why lakhtola will have to elaborate on this uh, is that you know it it sometimes happens that when you're trying to sort of think of infinity you know and you know basic math you say 10 divided by 3 it's 3.3333 it goes on infinitely and because we can't grasp where and how it might end we just stop at point 1 or we point 2 and the same thing happens with you know the sciences whole thing about the big bang i mean we know there is a big bang and but does big bang you know what is the cause of the big bang and then what is the cause of that you can go on infinitely and so where does shunya come into it so shunya has been you know uh, commonly translated as the emptiness of inherent existence and uh, now that's a difficult thing to sort of get your uh, you know mind around and uh, so uh, you know what do we mean by inherent existence and i think that what inherent existence means is and this is again lakhtarla's uh, you know teachings on interdependence so uh, if we look at i mean it's uh, these are all sort of very rough analogies so if you look at a cube of ice it is ice because it is dependent on certain causes and conditions you need a certain temperature and you have water and so it becomes ice and when those causes and conditions change it is no longer ice and so uh, when we say emptiness of inherent existence that i exist now uh because there are certain causes and conditions which started from the union of sperm and egg and then the food i ate and the things that i did have been the causes and conditions of my existence physical existence and including my mind my consciousness and a, a time will come when my this physical form that supposedly me which is constantly changing uh will lead to a situation where i cease to exist in this form and manner and so uh you know buddhism suggests that the continuity uh is really in what you know we call clear mind so the question comes that uh i you know the i and that is why lakhtarla is always talking about compassion diminishing and softening the i so if you remove the i then you know the you, you know, it, 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 you're no longer Uh, experience suffering because the i that experiences suffering and he also explained in one of the evenings that you know western psychology and their teachings have found that people who suffer a lot uh, tend to be obsessed with i me mine and so if you remove the i or soften the i then the i that suffers you know there's no i to suffer and it is dependent on you know xyz and so that you know that applies to all you know phenomena uh, and we use phenomena because it isn't just to do with objects it is to do with our emotions and feelings even uh, so even they are dependent on certain factors uh, i mean it, it could be the biochemistry of the brain to stimulus that comes in to our karma to whatever it may be and, uh, but i mean i i i just have to emphasize that you know we can i mean certainly at, at my level of understanding we can be beating i mean i can be beating around the bush going around and around in circles about this and unless someone has done some practice uh, to you know at least get a, a premonition so it's like saying okay i've you know i've smelled coffee but i haven't drunk it yet uh so you may get a little whiff of it occasionally and then when you just when you think you've got it it's gone and it really is people like his holiness who uh, you know come from that uh, embodiment uh, so he doesn't have to it's also you know what's also very interesting about his holiness is that even though he's uh, you know an avalokiteshvara uh, is that you know he engages in um, i don't know what 6 7 8 hours of practice every day because he's in human form and so that needs to be reinforced and you know he will often say to us that look you spend so much time beautifying yourself putting on makeup doing your nails luckily i have no hair to cut or, or you know or, uh, uh you know taking care of yourself and if you only spent that much time in practice and uh, you would then begin to get an intuitive sense 
uh, what it is. And I think the great, uh, you know, the great learning, uh, and so I'm a great fan of Lakhdar Lies, uh, is that uh, he is able to provide to us so vividly the correlation from everyday experience and vocabulary to the more profound teachings uh, so that we can relate to them. Uh, and that is very special for a monk because, you know, mostly monks live in the isolation of monasteries and have not experienced, uh, you know, samsara and are not able to you know, relate that and to bridge that gap. And so we're all very deeply privileged. And now I am going to stop talking and I, I think we should listen. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, please, you know, I, I think that, you know, please, please, please uh, introduce yourselves and uh, uh, you know, share with us who you are, where you're at in your life or anything that comes up uh, for you. I mean, if we were a, a physical Sangha, then it would be so much easier uh, to get to know each other better and about ourselves. So I promise I will keep quiet and listen. So who is going to walk the gauntlet? Ah, Joya. Okay. Okay, I am, yeah. Joya, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Oops, where is she? Hi, Joya, can you hear us? Yep, I sent her the request, I think. Yeah, she's unmuted. Hi, Joya. Or maybe someone else can fill this silence. <laughs> okay, Joya, please go ahead. She's unmuted. But, yeah, she's unmuted. Yeah, but she's speaking and we can't hear her. Maybe Jackie can go ahead for a while now. Okay. Yeah, Jackie. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, hi, I'm I'm Jackie. I actually oh. I didn't want to talk about myself. I actually wanted to ask Hassan Doma about her patient um that you spoke about last time. Um I know that you were going to um you asked about a patient um at your work last time. And um, I just wanted to see how that went. Just small talk. Um, well, instead I can just uh, open up the, I had a question um, when he was answering um, Dolma's question and um, Geshe-la was comparing um, uh, Bodhicitta was being like, like real Bodhicitta was being in the ocean and it's cool and not waving down below the on top, it's waving. And then when you actually have attachment, then it's waving below. And I didn't quite know if that was due to ignorance or how he used um, that compar comparison, if anyone had any ideas. Thank you. Sorry if I said that word. So please, someone has a thought to share. Look, I mean, you know, I'm not right. I'm not sure that I spoke sense. So please don't uh, uh, be hesitant. I think this we, you know, we're just sharing uh, our, our perceptions as fellow travelers. Uh, anyone uh, has any thought, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, I think I, I think the, you know the 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 the, the question was uh, about uh, you know bodhi bodhicitta and uh, the manner in which that manifests uh, itself. And uh, dimple, please raise your hand. Is a message I get. So dimple. Let us unmute you and, and, and listen to you. Come on. Yes. Ah. Dimple, are you unmuted? I'm sorry. I was, uh, I thought I was responding to Shunita. Uh, 
I'm not entirely uh, conversant with Bodhicitta. I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry, I've, um, I'm, I'm pretty new to Buddhism. But I, I have experienced Shunita uh, in terms of uh, breath work, mm -hmm. I, I would feel. Um, uh, and I, 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 I related directly to um, uh, breath work, really, uh, how one breathes, because um, breath just happens. And then is uh, you know then there's another breath, and um, there's so much can happen between those two breaths. So, in that sense, I have experienced. I feel I have experienced shunita, and then gone come back to, um, come back to the, the complexity of reality that needs to be dealt with, and then gone back. So I uh, that was my response to shunita. But I'm sorry, I, I don't have a response to bodhicitta. I have, as a matter of fact. A, question but I, I can wait to ask that question okay well you just hold on uh, uh, well, why didn't you while, while we're on uh, Shunya what was your uh, experience I mean just share with us uh, as best you can that uh, you know what you do with your breath and and what happens that you relate that to Shunya it'll be a learning uh -huh. I, I feel it's it's really a very organic process. It's a literally where you are um, spiritually and mentally, uh, how you're thinking, what you're thinking about, and it just happens. And then literally um, everything sort of um, contracts and then explodes again. So it's it's very it can be a very very expensive uh, topic if one gets to it. <laughs> I don't want to hog the time here, but um, uh, you know, in short, I would literally say, it is uh, when you're um, when you're thinking about something or you're doing something differently, perhaps um, the, uh, a shunita can happen. Um, and and I, it's literally got a mathematical correlation uh, in my head. Uh, shunita is directly proportional to your breath. Um, uh, your breath work. So um, the, I can literally only say so much. It, it can be a huge topic. And in, at the same time, it really boils down to this one little thing, thing for me. So, um, and, and, and of course, uh, in terms of semantics and all of the language that one wants to give it, um, certainly there's, uh, there's uh, it can be expressed in so many ways in so many languages. Um, but uh, at the bottom of it all, I feel it just literally boils down to this one little equation for me. I think in terms of mathematical equations, it's, 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 it's a habit. So um, uh, yeah, that's all I have to so, say. So, about. so what is that expression that comes up for you? Um, like I just said, it's uh, shunita is uh, directly proportional to your breath work, which happens organically, literally depending on where you are, uh, in your spiritual work or whatever. I'm, or, I don't have a definition for spiritual work. Um, everybody is, is, is on a different path, but uh, I do believe that there is, a, uh, there is a certain level of wisdom that you get to after wherever you've come from that, um, um, uh, that you can respond to certain situations in certain ways in which you can experience that shunita, no matter where you come from, uh, which um, uh, which context, which culture. The challenge is that since it's a non-conceptual experience, uh, to know that what we're experiencing is shunya, and, and are we giving it uh, the same label? Uh, Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just you know, I'm just posing the challenge. With but I think you know to go back to you know to Jackie's very uh, important uh, you know, idea of uh, you know what is uh, bodhicitta. Uh, 